In Jesus' name, good morning. good morning. Welcome to the Lord's house as we celebrate the second Sunday of Easter. My name is Pastor Andrew Cave along with Deacon Dennis Froming and we welcome all of you here. Uh, we do have uh, some visitors with us this morning. So uh, if we love to welcome our uh, first time visitors here in the name of the Lord. So if you are a first time visitor, we would love to welcome you. If you could just please let us know uh, who you are and where you're from. Oh, yes. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for joining us. We, uh, we always mug our visitors. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for joining us. And uh, yes, I saw your... Uh, Ray Sanchez from Ontario, California. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Ray and uh, let's see. Don't want to miss anyone. Okay. So, oh. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Yes. We normally we uh, we get a lot of. I, I mean, Wyoming, Utah, uh, California. These are great places to be from. Normally, at other times of the year, we get um, you know people from Minnesota, Michigan. You know, the Great White North. But I guess a uh, different time of year. So, thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, so, in terms of announcements, before I get on to announcements, I'm going to turn it over to Diane. She's got a couple of things to announce real quick. Um, they're making me do this. I don't want to use a microphone, but I can because I'm a mature adult. You guys, thank you so much for your supporting of our, our Spuds and Splits No Calorie, No Meal Served fundraiser. You know, I tell you, I look so forward to a year from now when I can serve you a banana split and a baked potato made the way you want it. It is so much fun to see everybody in line and to criticize their choices and their calories and I miss it so very much. But right now, um, our fundraiser stops today. Uh, today's the last day to donate and we're about at $1,400 dollars and all of the 100 percent of the proceeds of the spuds and splits and including this year goes directly to charities local charities in our town that includes the food bank that includes faith and grace and other charities that um that our women put forward so uh, to, to support so we are just thrilled with the no calorie no food served, spuds and splits. We just, your generosity is amazing and we thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Diane. Uh, in other announcements, uh, just uh, in related to that, uh, the LWML is having a meeting on April the 15th. Uh, that's a couple Thursdays, or I guess it's this coming Thursday, uh, April 15th. So uh, after you're finished filing your taxes, come on out for uh, the, uh, all women of the congregation are welcome to come at 1107. You will meet in the fellowship hall or on Zoom. They're doing both. If you want to join on Zoom, please send an email out to either Chris Lewis or Dolores Swenson. Their email addresses are in the announcement bulletin and they'll send you the link. Uh, in other announcements that a couple Sundays from now, the 25th is our quarterly, or sem not quarterly, semi-annual voters meeting. Uh, so there will be no adult Sunday school after, uh, after the service at 1030. Instead, after the service on Sunday morning, there will be a voters meeting. And it will be here in the sanctuary and also on Zoom. Uh, so be prepared for that. And Finally, I would like to announce to all of you, as you all know, uh, our dear brother in Christ, Bill Hellenberg, passed away recently, and his service is going to be Saturday, May the 1st. So just to let you all know that, Saturday, May the 1st is going to be the service for Bill Hellenberg. 
so that's uh, that's all I have in terms of announcements. Is there anything else to share with the congregation? Yes, Pastor Callio. Anyone desire private prayer, we can meet on the altar. Yeah, just a reminder that uh, we offer private prayer for anybody who feels a, a need and, and has something specific that they want prayed for. Uh, somebody will meet you up here uh, in front of the altar uh, at the conclusion of the service. We do it every week. So. All right, with that, as we gather. We tend to look for things that make faith easier. Signs, wonders, or just little hints here and there would help. But the disciples had all these things and heard Jesus promise his resurrection, and still they gathered behind the locked doors of their fears. What we do have is Christ, his word that bestows and sustains our faith, and his holy sacrament wherein he feeds us with his body and blood. Though we have not seen with our eyes, we see with faith and join with doubting Thomas to confess, My Lord and my God. Please join me in the words of our opening prayer. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Amen. Our hymn of invocation this morning is hymn number 464, The Strife is O'er, The Battle Done. Please stand. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. We take a moment of silence for reflection on God's word and for self-examination.
O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. We speak our intro responsively, and when we reach the Gloria Patri, we will sing that in unison. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up to salvation. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him tell of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wondrous works that he has done, his miracles and the judgments he utters. He remembers his covenant forever, the word that he commanded for a thousand generations. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up to salvation. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. We sing the Kyrie. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, 
Grant that we who have celebrated the Lord's resurrection may by your grace confess in our life and conversation that Jesus is Lord and God. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The first reading for the second Sunday of Easter is from Acts chapter 4. The full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands and houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to each as any had need. This is the word of the Lord. Our psalm this morning is Psalm 148. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him in the heights. Praise Him all His angels. Praise Him all His hosts. Praise Him sun and moon. Praise Him all His shining stars. Praise Him, you highest heavens. <clears throat> you above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord. For He commanded and they were created. And He established them forever and ever. He gave a decree and it shall not pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth. You great sea creatures and all beings. Fire and hail, snow and mist. Stormy wind fulfilling His word. Mountains and all hills. Trees and all seers, beasts and all livestock, things and birds, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and maidens together, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for His name alone is exalted. His majesty is above earth and heaven. He has raised up a horn for His people, praise for all His saints. For the people of Israel are near to Him. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The epistle is from 1 John. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and touched with our hands, concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest, and we have seen it, and testify to it, and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest in us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim to also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from Him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with Him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light and have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus His Son cleanses us from all sins. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all right, unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, and His word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the singing of the Alleluia and the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 20th chapter. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. 
When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from anyone, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in His name. This is the Gospel of our Lord. We now confess our common Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the kingdom of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. We sing our hymn of the day, hymn number 470, O Sons and Daughters of the King.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, it has been my practice over the years that I have been here to simply preach from the assigned lectionary reading for the day. That is a historic practice and one that offers great comfort and familiarity. However, there is another historic practice which has been used from time to time throughout church history, including by Martin Luther himself. And that is the practice of doing what you may call a catechetical sermon. These are sermons which are meant to teach in part or in whole the catechism, which is the basics and the fundamentals of our faith. And although we should always be reminding ourselves and refreshing our knowledge of the catechism constantly throughout our entire life, there can come a point in time when a local congregation has a particular need to once again be regrounded in the catechism. That need has come upon us. Though we are not going to walk through the entire catechism, we all have a need right now to hear once again what the scriptures teach and what we believe and confess regarding Holy Communion. And so, over the next several weeks, we will examine the Lord's Supper. What is it? What does it give to us? Who receives the Lord's Supper worthily? Who receives it unworthily? To whom should the Lord's Supper be given? To whom should the Lord's Supper not be given? These are all the questions which we will seek to answer over the coming weeks. Before we dive into what the New Testament says about the Lord's Supper, today's message will be about what the Old Testament says concerning this meal. Now, the Lord's Supper was not present in the Old Testament, but it was foreshadowed. After all, when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, he said of the cup, This cup is poured out, that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. In saying that his blood is the blood of the new covenant, he is therefore acknowledging that there was a blood of the old covenant. Jesus' blood, as well as his body in this meal, are not simply a covenant that came from nothing. Rather, they fulfill that which was promised beforehand. What was promised and, and foreshadowed in the Old Covenant is now brought to completion in Christ. As the Lord promised through the prophet Jeremiah, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Though the Lord's Supper is foreshadowed in many ways and in many places, we'll examine certain key passages. First, we will examine the times when the people had meals with Yahweh. The clearest example of this is in Exodus chapter 24. After Israel had been rescued and brought out of Egypt, and the Lord had given His covenant to the people on Mount Sinai, Moses took the blood of the sacrificial animals, and half of it he threw against the sides of the altar, and half of it he threw over the people. And then Moses and his brother Aaron, Aaron's sons Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders went up on the mountain, and they saw the God of Israel. There was under his feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven for clearness. And he did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel. They beheld God and ate and drank. Representatives of God's people ate and drank in the presence of God. Another key passage takes place even earlier in the narrative of God's people. When Abram, who would later be renamed Abraham, had rescued his nephew Lot, he was met by a priest named Melchizedek. Melchizedek was also the king of a city named Salem. The name Melchizedek means the king is righteousness, and Salem means peace. Thus, he is not only the king of righteousness, but also the king of peace. Melchizedek brought out bread and wine. And Abram gave to Melchizedek a tenth of everything. These passages, as well as other passages that record meals with Yahweh, anticipate the Lord's Supper in at least five ways. First, in these narratives, the promises of the covenant are central. Without the covenant, these meals are meaningless. Second, Yahweh is the host. And his presence is a sign of his faithfulness to his promises. Third, 
there is a prominent place for the sacrificial victim and its blood. Fourth, there are miraculous dimensions described with these meals. And fifth and finally, there is a holistic concern of Yahweh for both the soul and the body of his people. But certainly, no meal is more central to the Old Covenant than the Passover. And no meal is more directly related to the Lord's Supper than the Passover because Jesus was celebrating the Passover with his disciples when he instituted the Lord's Supper. Now, the setting of the first Passover is familiar to many of us. It happened in the context of God delivering his people out of bondage of slavery in Egypt. On the tenth day of the first month, the people were to take a lamb, either from the sheep or the goats, and it was to be without blemish. On the fourteenth day of the month, the people killed their lambs at twilight. On that first Passover in Egypt, the blood of the man was smeared over the doorposts of the houses. And that blood conveys God's forgiveness and salvation. As the Lord said, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. This meal, the Passover, was to be kept as an eternal memorial throughout all of Israel's generations. And it was to be kept in the context of a holy assembly. In other words, this was an act of corporate worship. For the seven days of the feast, from the 14th day of the month to the 21st, there was to be no leaven or yeast in any house in Israel, which is symbolic of purity. This meal and its meaning were intimately connected to the central salvation event of the Old Testament, the deliverance of the people out of Egypt. And this meal was not open to everyone. Only the circumcised were permitted to eat of it, whether Israelite or a foreigner who had joined themselves to them. The Passover thus prepares the way for the Lord's Supper in at least four ways. First, the Passover is a type of Christ's crucifixion. And by type, what we mean is that it was a real and tangible event that portrayed what would later be fulfilled by Jesus Christ. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. His blood poured out not on doorposts, but on the cross. Second, the Passover prepares the way because it is blood which is the means by which God delivers His people. Third, the Passover is meaningless apart from Israel's exodus from Egypt. Likewise, the Lord's Supper is meaningless apart from Jesus' death, which in the Gospel of Luke is described as His exodus. Finally, the Passover is an act of God, not an act of the people. It is an act of God in which His people acknowledge, confess, and declare that He is their Savior. And while the Passover is the most important foreshadowing of the Lord's Supper, there are a couple of other passages that merit our attention. First, we will consider the account of God providing manna in the wilderness. In an action that was both ironic and tragic, only a month and a half after being rescued from Egypt, the Israelites complained to Moses in the wilderness that they had nothing to eat and they wished that they had stayed in Egypt. Thus, they spurned what had happened in the Passover. And yet, God came to them in mercy. He provided manna, bread from heaven, for their daily food. And while there are certainly differences between the manna in the wilderness and the Lord's Supper, there are striking similarities. The manna was provision for their wilderness wanderings. The Lord's Supper is given to us to sustain us in our pilgrimage in the wilderness of this world. The manna was a sign of God's goodness and care for His people, as well as His patience with them. And we cannot forget how when the Jews sought out Jesus following the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is He who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to Him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, 
and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Finally, we ought to consider the peace offerings of the Old Covenant. There were many different sacrifices that God commanded through Moses. Peace offerings were made for the purpose of communion with God and acceptance before God. In the peace offerings, the sacrificial animal was to be without blemish. Certain prescribed parts were to be burned on the altar, thus being a pleasing aroma to the Lord. The people who brought the sacrifice would then eat the other parts of it, and this was the only sacrifice in which the lay people ate anything of the sacrificial animal. In the other sacrifices, the animal was either entirely burned up or part of it was eaten by the priest. However, there were specific prohibitions on the drinking of the blood, and this sacrifice was meant to be eaten with a spirit of great joy. Thus, the peace offerings were a, of the Old Covenant were a foretaste of the Lord's Supper in several ways. First, whereas the drinking of blood was once forbidden, now the blood of the Christ is freely given as a permanent payment for sin. Second, the eating of this meal is a testimony of God's covenant. Third, this eating is a human communion with God. Now, the, although the eating of the peace offerings is not eating and drinking the flesh and blood of God as we do in the Lord's Supper, nevertheless, it was a communion with God because the meal was joined to the altar. And finally, as God was pleased with the aroma of the sacrifice, so likewise God is pleased with the sacrifice of His Son on the cross. So in summary, what can we say about what the Old Testament teaches us about meals with God? First, by eating and drinking, God's provision is certainly a picture of God giving His grace and His gracious benefits to His people. It is God giving His people the gospel. Second, the abundance of God's provision shows both His goodness and His concern for the whole person, both their soul and their body. Also, being in a state of being hungry and thirsty can, on the one hand, be a sign of being under God's wrath. But on the other hand, it can remind us that the ultimate satisfaction comes not in this life, but in the life of the world to come. Thus, what the Old Testament teaches us about the Lord's Supper is that blood is a sign of God's gracious covenant. And that bread is also a sign of God's grace. The Old Testament teaches us that God's Word does what it says. It's a performative Word. It accomplishes that which it says. The Old Testament clearly teaches that a lamb can be a substitute for God's people. The Old Testament also clearly teaches that God's favor and faithfulness to His people is not in the least bit dependent upon your works or merits. It's all based on His loving kindness and covenant faithfulness. And the Old Testament teaches us that when the Lord appears to His people in a shared meal, that is a confirmation of His covenant faithfulness and His fellowship with His people. Thus concludes our examination of the Old Testament background which paves the way for the fulfillment that we see in the New Testament. And it is to that which we will turn to in our sermon next week. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please stand for prayer. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. On a prayer request this morning, prayers requested for Linda Weiske as she recovers from surgery and for uh, Lori Anderson also recovering from surgery. We pray all that goes well and they have quick, uh, quick healing. Heavenly Father, by the resurrection of your Son, you adopt all who believe in Him. Receive us as your newborn children and nourish our faith by the pure spiritual milk of your Word that we may dwell in your presence forever. Lord, in your mercy. <clears throat> Almighty God, you have declared peace between God and man in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Receive our thanks for the authority given to your church on earth, and grant that the ministers of your church would faithfully carry out their office and pronounce the free forgiveness of sins upon all repentant sinners. Lord, in your mercy. 
Merciful Father, as your people are united in the common life and love of our Savior, grant that we would share that life and love with those in need. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, your peace flows from the risen and glorified wounds of Christ through your church and into the lives of all your faithful people. Bless and direct Christian parents that you, your forgiveness would be freely shared in their homes and that each family would live together in your peace. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, you appoint rulers and officials for the sake of order and peace. Bless those who have, you have placed in authority over us in the federal, state, and local governments. Give to them the desire to serve with integrity and honor and to work for the benefit of all. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, bless our people on active duty in the military service at this time. Joseph, Eric, Ray, Nick, Trevor, Wyatt, Zach, Zoshi, Matthew, Aaron, Parker, Lisa, Trevor, Kurt, Jess. Bless our police officers, firefighters, and emergency medical personnel as they are put into harm's way, keeping safe those whom they serve. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, we praise your Son's resurrection from the dead and draw strength from his ascension before you, where he ever stands for us as our high priest. Especially we pray for Linda, Fran, Jean, Jessica, Stacy, Henry, Ireland, Lorna, Gavin, Christine, Roger, Mary, Ariel, Bernice, Randy, Tony, Thelma, Linda, and Glenn. Graciously receive our prayers of intercession and hear them for his sake. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you that out of your indescribable grace and for the sake of your Son, you have given us the Holy Spirit, Holy Gospel, and instituted the Holy Sacraments, that through them we may have comfort in the forgiveness of sin. Grant us your Holy Spirit, that we may heartily believe your word, and through the Holy Sacraments establish our faith day by day, until at last we obtain eternal salvation through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We pray as Jesus taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated as we sing hymn number 472. Please stand.
Almighty God, grant to your church your Holy Spirit and the wisdom that comes down from above, that your word may not be bound but have free course and be preached to the joy and edifying of Christ's holy people, that in steadfast faith we may serve you and in the confession of your name abide unto the end. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Bless we the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen, he is risen indeed. Alleluia. You may be seated as we sing our closing hymn, hymn number 720, We Walk by Faith and Not by Sight. I want to thank you all for joining us in our worship service this morning and uh, Bible study will begin afterwards in the fellowship hall and just a reminder that the ushers will be dismissing uh, by row. May God be with you. <laughs>